We don't judge our friends on the basis of the color of their skin. We judge them on the basis of the fact uh, of whether or not they are willing to go all the way with us. If they are not willing to go all the way, then they are not friends of ours. Savs, just that one part from James Farmer. He said, do we judge them if they are willing to go all the way with us? Your thoughts, please. It sounds very uh, familiar, uh, even in reference to today and building movements and any type of, uh, I guess, grassroots actions that we have been a part of or we've wanted to try to build. It really speaks volumes and it's true. There's a difference between uh, having unity with someone and having solidarity. And you and I have talked about this quite often. I am past the days of wanting to have unity. Unity is the easy way, right? It's much harder to have solidarity with someone because that means you have to put someone else's needs above your own. And what I have found, uh, particularly with some of the people that consider themselves to be white allies, what I have found is that they're not willing to actually have solidarity. Not all of them, but you have to think about what he just said in that video and how many people were a part of the march on Washington, both black and white. Uh, they, Like he said, they were willing to go all the way. And what I think we found, particularly when we talk about movements or movement building in this country, is that a lot of these people who say that they want unity with us, they're not willing to go all the way. And when you say that and you push back on that and you say, I'm looking for someone willing to go all the way, all of a sudden you're divisive. So you see how things have changed since the civil rights movement when we talk about movement building. And that's why I always use that one as a good example of how to build a movement because they knew what the difference was between unity and solidarity. And they knew that the people that were going to be marching along with them had to be willing to go all the way. And that is not divisive. That is called solidarity. That's just how yeah. I see it. So here we go. Savvy Sabs joins me live on the JB Font channel. Good to see you again, Sabs. Hey, JB, what's going on? All right, looking great. Looking, Sabs, okay, before I start, I wanted to say this because I was just like, I was watching your show the other day and I was just like, man, I can definitely see the difference. I was looking at you and I was like, your arms look more toned. <laughs> I was like, I'll be moving soon. Maybe she can help me with some furniture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've been I, I've been in the gym just working on my fitness. Use my witness. <laughs> <Ooh. laughs> no, um, I, I, I spend a lot of time in the gym. It's, it's so funny because on stream, this is probably, unless I'm like going out with my friends or something like that. Other than that, I kind of live in workout clothes. Like, I'm not kidding. That's what people don't really? see. I have on like workout leggings right now. Like that's typically wow. what I would wear the most is workout clothes. Um, except for like, if I want, if I do a show, if I go on someone's show, or if I do my own show, I'm going to wear like real clothes. If I go out with my friends, I'm going to have on real, real clothes. But most of the time, like I kind of live in athletic gear. I'm, I'm not kidding. <laughs> you have, a, something tells me you have the, Fluffiest socks and the fluffiest house shoes ever. You probably really enjoy your house shoes, don't you? Yeah, I have uh, <laughs> fleece socks. <laughs> yeah, I, do it. I was just like, oh, wow, okay. But I don't know. It's just you, 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 like, because every single time I see you, you're in sneakers, and I'm like, she really does like comfort when it comes to what she steps in. That's what uh, I, I got that feeling. Yeah, if I know I'm going to be walking around for a while, like if I'm going to go cover anything on the ground, I'm wearing sneakers. If I'm at the gym, obviously I'm wearing sneakers. If I'm if I'm not going to something that's like a nicer event, like if I'm going out for a friend's birthday, then I'll put on like, you know, either my boots or heels or something like that. But most of the time uh, I'm wearing like either casual sneakers or workout sneakers, like most of the time. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty awesome. Uh, I, I'm the same way. Like I'm always in pajamas. I don't know what it is, but I'm at home. I'm always in pajamas. You come to my house, you knock on my door, you're going to see me in a t-shirt and pajamas. That's pretty much it because that's how I am. But that's a little too much TMI. But one of the things that I want to get into is um, 
I wanted to get your reactions to these partic this particular video. I'm not going to play the entirety, but there's pieces of it that I would like for you to react to. And one of the reasons why I want to is because one of the things that I, I take inspiration from is that especially, you know, you've always talked about Black issues on your channel, but you seem to have ramped it up even more because I, I it feels like there needs to be more of it than, you know, we, we've had before. Because a lot of times what we see on the left is a lot of times we'll have people that say, well, don't talk about race, only talk about class. And y you have said this before that class, I'm sorry, yes, class is an identity. Um, and so if you can give me just a little bit of the, 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 the reasoning more deeper uh, of why you're expounding more on black issues and as of date, as of late. I think part of it has to do with uh, when we talk about Israel and Gaza, right? Like I saw some of the hypocrisy. I saw some of the same people who said not to focus on identity politics have no problem all of a sudden focusing on uh, the, the Palestinian struggle. Now, all of a sudden, all these people are passionate about Palestinian people. And I think, you know, like me, you and the rest of us at RBN, we actually were talking about this years ago. Like we didn't start talking about the Palestinian struggle after October 7th. We started covering this from the very first year that we started. I think even for my channel, that was the first foreign policy issue that I covered. So mm -hmm. I think that it was interesting to see a number of people that have explained multiple times, like not to focus on race, whenever it was a particularly an issue that deals with black people, don't talk about race, just focus on class. Don't talk about identity politics. And, and as you pointed out, I've said to people that class is also an identity. So it's just, it's really weird. But what was became very obvious to me is that they didn't want you to focus on the black identity, right? They didn't want you to focus on the LGBTQ identity because those identities don't work well for their audience. Mm. That's what that was really about. But all of a sudden after October 7th, now all of a sudden it's okay to focus on a, an identity that you know your audience is going to agree with for the most part. So for me, it was just, I, I had to call out that hypocrisy. And mm -hmm. then two, I wanted people to fully understand that what the Palestinian people are going through, you know, there is a direct link and connection to black struggle that those of us that are American descendants of slavery have had to go through in this country, right? Yeah. And, and of course, our ancestors. So I think that if you can call for repair for the Palestinian people, then you need to explain to me why you're against calling for repair for American descendants of slavery. So mm -hmm. I think October 7th has really pulled the mask off of, of some people who were doing that. And I think it's really important. So we got to focus on those issues. At the same time, I've, I've seen people that are, are Palestinian or are from the Muslim community call for an uh, uncommitted vote or calling for a ceasefire and saying, no, Joe Biden, you have to do something for our community in order yeah. for you to receive our votes. Well, mm -hmm. then again, I wanted to take that and relate that back to the black community about why aren't we doing that? Yeah. You know, why why aren't we calling for some type of concession for mm -hmm. our vote? I'm not going to vote for the Democratic Party regardless. But for those who just do so because they're party loyalists, why aren't they calling for some type of concession from the Democratic Party in order for the Democratic Party to get their vote? So I tried to make the connection there so they can really understand that other groups do this. Other groups have received concessions from the Democratic Party and African-Americans for the most part have not. Yeah. So that that was my my take on that. That was my thing is to get people to wake up and understand, see how uh, the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are willing to bend over backwards for Israel and for the yeah. Israeli people and see how when you ask for concessions, they tell you now's not the time or no way that's going to happen. Forget about it. So I, I was hoping that yeah. October 7th has really woken people up. Yeah. And just as uh, to add to your point, when we see, and, and let's be real, what's happened in Gaza, we have witnessed a 75 year Holocaust. 
See, a lot of people will will take issue with me using that word, but uh, if you look at the actual definition of a Holocaust, it doesn't mean one specific event that happened in history. It is a massive, basically death that's caused by genocide and all these different things, you know, against a particular group of people. You have the Holocaust that happened in Germany in the late 1930s and early 1940s, right? That everybody knows. And all you got to say is the Holocaust, and that's what everybody means. But a lot of people do not talk about the 500-year Holocaust that has happened on Turtle Island against the indigenous people of this land. They do not talk about the Holocaust of West African peoples through the transatlantic slave trade. That's also a Holocaust. They don't talk about the the Holocaust that happened in East Timor. They do not talk about the Congolese Holocaust that happened at the hands of King Leopold. These are Holocausts that have happened over time that a lot of people don't really pay much attention to, particularly if the Holocaust happens to somebody who's more melanin abundant. So I think that we need to also, if you are willing to side with the Palestinians, uh, you know, and and want freedom and reparations for the Holocaust that they are enduring, which they absolutely need, then you should also do it for the black people, the American descendants of slaves that are living among you right here. And you also should be standing in solidarity with the people who are of indigenous descent that are asking for the land back that was stolen from them from European powers 500 years ago. So it's it's like if you're going to be consistent, if you're going to be consistent and be consistent, that's basically my argument. That's right. I, I agree a hundred percent. And even when we talk about what happened to slaves that were, you know, brought to this country, we're talking about the fact that, you know, some of them didn't even make it to the United States because they got sick because of the horrible treatment uh, on the boats. So they would actually take them and throw them into the ocean. They would actually take or the slaves them. and throw, yeah, throw them into the, oh, you know, so these are things that are not talked about. And when we talk about what happened, uh, with slavery, uh, it's been whitewashed in reference to textbooks and educational institutions. It has been whitewashed. So you don't know the thick of it. Like I think JB and I know some of the, the real horrors that happened that you'll never see like in a textbook. Uh, so there's even more, it, it goes deeper, but there, there's that. And then there's Jim Crow, there's redlining, there's, you know, the, the crime bills there. I mean, this, this goes on and on and on. Uh, and there's a reason why you look around and you see we're only 13% of the population. So you have to talk about the things that happened after slavery as well, not just uh, what happened during slavery. Absolutely. So with that being said, this was a perfect setup. So thank you so very much. Let me share this right now because I think this is really going to, it, it's, it's from 1963. So we're going back a long time, but what was said is extremely relevant today. I'm not sure if you ever saw this, Sabs, but let's get into it. People like Agnes Myers, Roy, uh, president of the board of the NAACP and other white liberals and friends have cautioned against having a major demonstration for civil rights this summer. How do you... Now, what he means by the major demonstration of civil rights this summer is the 19... I think it's the 1964... 1963 and 1964 March on Washington where where Dr. King actually gave the I dream of... I have a dream speech. So this is before that. So they're planning for that. Well... It's our position in the NAACP that the opponents of civil rights legislation uh, left no doubt as soon as the president spoke. In fact, they didn't wait for him to speak. They began announcing their opposition and what they intended to do. Uh, They were going to filibuster. They were going to hold up uh, appropriation measures. They were talking, scaring the country that they weren't going to get a tax cut on account of civil rights. They're doing all the boogeyman stunts. And if they're going to use Washington as their base of operations 
for opposition to this bill, we don't see anything wrong with using Washington as our base to uh, indicate support for this bill. And in my estimation, this march is going to be a 100% outpouring of the disgust and distress of uh, black Americans and white liberals over the way the Congress has handled this bill. I think that in any such demonstration as the march, which is planned, you will expect a um, loud outpouring of uh, cries of uh, fears from many, many people who don't want it to take place, uh, who are afraid that something might happen. But it seems to me that it reflects a lack of understanding of the nature of the times in which we are living. The fact that Negroes all over the country are concerned and are aroused and must express their feeling. They waited a hundred years and that's too long to wait. But what about white friends and liberals who have worked in these organizations for many years who now say, look, uh, let's not go this fast. Let's not. Uh, we don't have people like that. I'm yeah. sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Our telephone yeah. is ringing with white people who want to get into the march. We don't judge our friends on the basis of the color of their skin. We judge them on the basis of the fact uh, of whether or not they are willing to go all the way with us. If they are not willing to go all the way, then they are not friends of ours. Savs, just that one part from James Farmer. He said, we judge them if they're willing to go all the way with us. Your thoughts, please. It sounds very uh, familiar, uh, even in reference to today and building movements and any type of, uh, I guess, grassroots actions that we have been a part of or we've wanted to try to build. It really speaks volumes and it's true. There's a difference between uh, having unity with someone and having solidarity. And you and I have talked about this quite often. I am past the days of wanting to have unity. Unity is the easy way, right? It's much harder to have solidarity with someone because that means you have to put someone else's needs above your own. And what I have found, uh, particularly with some of the people that consider themselves to be white allies, what I have found is that they're not willing to actually have solidarity. Not all of them. But you have to think about what he just said in that video and how many people were a part of the march on Washington, both black and white. Uh, they, Like he said, they were willing to go all the way. And what I think we found, particularly when we talk about movements or movement building in this country, is that a lot of these people who say that they want unity with us, they're not willing to go all the way. And when you say that and you push back on that and you say, I'm looking for someone willing to go all the way, all of a sudden you're divisive. So you see how things have changed since the civil rights movement when we talk about movement building. And that's why I was used that one as a good example of how to build a movement because they knew what the difference was between unity and solidarity. And they knew that the people that were gonna be marching along with them had to be willing to go all the way. And that is not divisive. That is called solidarity. That's just how yeah. I see it. Yeah. You know, and the thing is, is that a lot of times, um, you know, are you willing to have solidarity with people, even if it does not benefit you personally? Right. Is it, are you doing it because it's the right thing to do or are you because you're going to get a benefit out of it? Because how, how would land back for the indigenous people benefit me? Like directly, how would it benefit me? But I support it, why? Because it's the right thing to do, right? That's why I stand with them. Why do I stand with people who are trans and, and their rights, right? Because number one, they're workers too. Number two, it's because it's just the right thing to do. Now, some people may be like, oh my God, they're trans, whatever. But the thing is, is like, look, they're workers, they're people. They're not harming me and they're making, and, and by them being workers, it behooves me to have solidarity with them because if I want to have a workers movement, there they are. They're right there. Just because one puts on a dress or just because one puts on overalls, it doesn't mean a damn thing. What, me, what, what actually matters is us coming together. And so- Great. Go ahead. <laughs> that's right. And, and that's why I think uh, when people point out those issues, when they focus on uh, talking or I guess really like harping on like, you know, the, those culture war issues, when they focus on attacking people of a certain identity and 
what they're what they're really trying to say is that they want those people to put aside who they really are to go along with the majority. That's really what they're asking them to do. They're asking them to forget the fact that they're LGBTQ, forget the fact that you're black and just go along with what the majority wants so that the majority feels more comfortable instead yeah. of acknowledging the fact that these people are workers too. You know, so it's like, and this is why some people will say when you call for a working class movement, this is why some black people have said you're basically speaking about white workers. That's why some people say that because they've received that type of rhetoric in reference to black workers in reference to LGBTQ workers, et cetera. I mean, we can do all of this at once. And this is another reason why I pushed back and I said that podcasters should not lead a movement. We have no problem being a part. I don't think we couldn't be a part of it. I think, but as as role as media, I think it's great for us to amplify that movement, uh, to give it as much attention as possible. If we want to participate, that's great. If we want to cover it on the ground, I think that's awesome, which you and I tend to do, but I don't think we should lead it. And, and I say this again, because we've seen how this has happened before in the media space where a podcaster will take the lead on some type of movement or action. And then the next thing you know, when they start to get backlash from audience members, then all of a sudden it's let me walk away from this because this is going to hurt my brand. And that's why I don't think that they should be the ones to lead those movements. These movements need to be led by people that are part of the grassroots, the people that are in the streets. And there are organizations that have been doing this for quite some time. The Palestinian protests that you see happening all across the country, that's not led by podcasters. Those are pro predominantly led by Answer Coalition, uh, yeah. PSL, like these organizations that really got thousands of people out there in the streets. And that's the way it should be, you know? Yeah. So I, I think that when we talk about building movements, we need to look at what has already been done before in the past. And then you can look at maybe some of the mistakes that they made and learn from those mistakes. But I feel like one of the things that's been holding us back is that people are trying to reinvent the wheel and you're just yeah. making the work harder for yourself, right? Sometimes you don't need to do that. Sometimes all you need to do is take something that was already done, tweak it a bit and go with that. I would also like to add that politicians should not leave movements. You see, we're constantly looking for a movement leader that's running for office. They're the complement, not the actual movement themselves. It's like, how can I put it? It's, it's kind of like um, a, okay, you and I, we like food, right? Full disclosure. Sorry to put your business out there, but you had burgers yesterday, right? So, with that being said, a politician is the condiment, not the burger. Right? Do you get what I mean? Because the thing is, is like they're there to maybe enhance the movement, but they aren't supposed to lead the movement. Who eats a ketchup sandwich? <laughs> I love that, JB. <laughs> right? No. The meat needs to be the people on the ground. So if you have a politician that's going, I'm here to lead a movement. And no, 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 no. It's not. Mm -mm. It ain't going nowhere. Because once November happens, or once, you know, November of any election year happens, then what happens? Right? Because we saw this with who? Bernie Sanders. Same thing. It should not be a politician that's leading the movement either. That's just, how, I guess you got to say that. No, I agree 100%. I think Bernie taught all of us that lesson, right? When he said that he would still be outside uh, with his movement, with his people, if he lost the election. And obviously that wasn't the case. So I think we have definitely learned uh, from that experience. At least I hope most of us have learned from that experience that like, you know, these are people that are trying to protect a political career that they have in their political future. So at the end of the day, I mean, they're going to try to rally as much support as they can possible. But at the end of the day, they're going to look out for themselves. Absolutely. Let's continue. This is this is just beautiful the way this continues. Now, we've said that these are interracial organizations. 
but you five gentlemen are Negroes. You are assuming the leadership and you are asking white liberals and white friends to go along with the Negro speaking for himself rather than speaking through white surrogates. I would like to make this point um, because I think there is a misconception that uh, any white people who happen to serve on your boards or committees are therefore automatically there Dictator. to exercise control and restraint. Yeah. This is not the experience of the Urban League. There are many white people who serve on our boards who are asking for more militancy. I speak for the National Urban League at their insistence, not at my demanding, because they feel that a Negro is best able to express the hopes and the longings of his people. We ought to be clear that there is a desire on the part of Negroes for self-expression uh, through leadership of uh, uh, civil rights organizations. This is important because Negroes have been denied that self-expression for so many years. But this does not mean in any sense of the word, as far as I'm concerned, that white persons who are sincere cannot participate and cooperate. Exactly. And now, one of the things that this also points to is, I know you, it was you, me, Colin, and Afini on Savvy and JB show on RBN a couple weeks back that talked about who should lead movements. I think one of the things that has to be harped on is, because I know we talked about podcasters, but there's another side to this. And I think it's kind of uncomfortable for some people, but, and I, I think I, I think I've heard Afini say this too. But the people who really should be leading the movements should be the people who are the most disenfranchised. What say you? Right. Right. The people that are affected the most. Right. Um, now, it, it gets tricky, though, because if you think about some of the revolutionary leaders in the past, a lot of them were PMC, mm -hmm. uh, Fidel Castro, uh, Che Guevara. Um, mm -hmm. One could argue even Marx. Yeah. I, I mean, it's. it's he, he was, you know, uh, affluent. Right, right. A, a lot of them were. It just seemed like back then they were willing to go all the way, even though they were like PMC. They were willing to call for and be about, you know, a revolution. Mm -hmm. Whereas today, it just seems like a lot of them are in support of reform. <laughs> yeah. So it's been it's been watered down. But no, I totally understand where Afini's coming from because those are the people who are predominantly affected like the people who like we think about medicare for all when we had those marches for medicare for all like a lot of the people that were actually out there and you saw this because you were at the the march in orlando i was at the mm -hmm. march here in boston a lot of the people that were part of the march were people that were a working class that had a story they had a medicare for all story they were directly impacted and affected by the healthcare system in this country now those weren't necessarily the people that were the speakers at those events the speakers tend to be a little bit more like bigger names uh some of them former politicians some of them uh medical physicians uh but I think that really said something when you had all different types of people just kind of come together and march for Medicare for all in this country who had all been impacted by the healthcare system in some way, shape or form. And I, I think that really, really says something. Yeah, definitely. Um, I didn't get to finish that piece that I wanted to due to the sake of time, but there's this one part that I really wanted to harp on. And this is more of the cherry on top that I wanted to share with you as well. This is going to be some thoughts by James Farmer as well. James Farmer, I, this dude was speaking bars. Let's let's go to this part. But aren't we saying, gentlemen, that a program has not yet been worked out to grapple with the magnitude of this problem in the United States, okay. both North and South. It's and not regional. Right. Isn't there a need now, because of the urgency and the seriousness of the situation, to develop a, a sort of crash program uh, to lift the standards of the Negro and to get rid of the underlying conditions that produce so many social evils and develop so many social problems. I, I think this is what we face at this time. And I know it uh, leads to the whole question of discrimination in reverse and all of that. But uh, I think we've got to face the fact in, in this country that because of the legacy of slavery and 
segregation and the, the seeds of injustice planted in the past, that we have this harvest of confusion now, and we are going to continue to have it until we get to the root of the problem. Well, that's uh, yeah. that root and the rats go together. Yeah. The announcement of the Real Estate Brokers Association some time ago advising their members not to pay any attention to fair housing laws, that property rights still came first. And when you think of the billions of dollars in this country tied up in real estate, there isn't much that the President of the United States could do by going and looking at some slums, let's be fair. Yeah, well, and the real the real power and obstacle there is the is the property rights structure in this country, which isn't concerned with how many kids are bitten by rats or how many people live in slums. Most of you recall that we did announce recently <laughs> our board adopted this domestic Marshall Plan, and this was uh, yes. consciously given this name because, if you recall, this country has spent some twelve billion dollars. On, uh, uh, on rehabilitation of Europe, war-torn Europe. Uh, in a four-year period, we have spent millions on refugees from Cuba and from Hungary. We spent uh, all kinds of money giving free education to veterans after the war and making it possible for them to buy a home. I think the time has come for us to honestly face up to the fact that this tremendous gap due to historical deprivation that the Negro has suffered will not be closed not quickly enough unless we consciously and deliberately establish programs that call not just for equal schools, but better schools and better teachers and provisions for housing and, and conscious recruiting uh, at the level of employment. This has to be done in order to get rid of what I see too much of, and that is the feeling of despair and hopelessness. I think that Negroes have had special treatment in this country for 350 years. Special treatment of a negative sort. That's right. Now what Whitney and the rest of us are asking for is some special treatment it's of a positive, positive sort right. to wipe right. out uh, that gap. Are you? That's the part I wanted you to hear. Yeah. Yeah, 100%. Uh, some special treatment of a positive sort. Right. Which has been done for for other groups or people who don't understand, like the Japanese Americans that were part of the internment camps in the United States. They were given reparations and they were given cash reparations, by the way. Uh, It was Ronald Reagan who signed that into existence, believe it or not, and their descendants. So you got to know these things when people push back against reparations for American descendants of slavery. So that happened for the Japanese Americans that were part of the internment camps. And then you got to talk about the survivors of the Holocaust, which there are still, yes, Germany paid reparations as they should have, but there have still been reparation measures that have been implemented by the United States since then. And this is another thing that people don't talk about. So we need to talk about what Kathy Hochul just did. Kathy Hochul just signed away again, implementing more reparations towards Holocaust survivors. This was recent. So these kinds of things have been happening for years. There was also reparations that was implemented under Barack Obama for Holocaust survivors. So nobody said anything. No one had a problem with it. Everyone was okay with it and cool. But the moment that American descendants of slavery ask for reparations, it is a problem. So again, as I pointed out before, when people say, don't I talk, don't talk about identity politics, they're mainly talking about, don't talk about black people. Don't talk about being black. Don't talk about race means don't talk about being black. I want to be very clear about that. Don't talk about identity politics and reference to gender and sexuality. Don't talk about being LGBTQ. You can talk about being straight though. This is what this is about. I want people to understand because if you can sit there and if you can understand what the Palestinian people are going through, which rightfully so and advocate for rightfully so, then you can understand what has happened to American descendants of slavery in this country throughout the years. And you can advocate for that as well. But you don't because your audience would be against it. And that is why, once again, I say podcasters should not lead movements. And I I can't, I'm so surprised that people can't see through this till this day. Like you really have to see through this and start doing your own research. If anybody can tell you, don't talk about race, don't talk about that, that's identity politics, just focus on class. One, they don't know that class is a part of identity politics. So there's that. Two, they do know it but they know that that sells better with the audience because they don't want to talk about the racial issues because their audience members won't like it. So there's that as well. 
And it, it still boggles my mind till this day that people haven't woken up to what is really being said. Do you think that MLK would have told you, don't focus on class, don't focus on race at all, just focus on class? Do you think Martin Luther King would have, not MLK, excuse me, do you think Malcolm X would have said that? Do you think Fred Hampton would have said that? No, yeah. none of these people would have said that because they realized that class and race actually intercept. So why are people buying into that today? Yep, absolutely. And due to the sake of time, I want to be very respectful. We are a little bit over than what you said, you know, as far as time. But, uh, you know, I just want to thank you for being able to, you know, lay this out as, as you know, uh, as strongly as possible in, in very clear, concrete terms, you know, um, and your analysis was deeply necessary for this. And I really wanted to share this with you because I think it's that important. Uh, and also, if you can let everybody know what's going on you for your show. And I know you have your show tonight. And I know you also did an interview on Rising earlier today. So what do you got going on? Yeah, today was a busy day. So I was on Rising earlier this morning. I checked that out. We talked about uh, AOC donating money to the DCCC. Uh, I will be live uh, tonight on my channel, 7 p.m. Eastern time. We're doing uh, four news stories. I think uh, three of them are foreign policy, actually. And we're going to talk about the SCOTUS ruling in reference to protests. So don't miss that because that affects all of us. Uh, and then uh, th I think Thursday, I, I may be live earlier in the day instead of in the evening, because I think Max Blumenthal may be coming on. And if if that happens on Thursday, then I will definitely be live earlier that day, not in the evening. All right. So there may not be a Savvy and JB show this Thursday. Just letting you guys know, because Savs is a very, very busy woman. Sabs, I want to thank you so very much for coming to my humble little channel. It means the world to me. You're doing the damn thing, JB. Thank you. Thank you so very much. All right. And also, just to let you guys know, I'll put Sabby's. Uh, you don't really need it because, I mean, you're way bigger than me. But I'll put your channel in the description as well so that if you guys would like to turn into Savvy Sabs, you guys have her. And then also you can tune into us at Revolutionary Blackout Network as well. Thanks, JB. All right. Bye-bye, Sabs. Bye. Thank you so very much for watching my channel, and I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash JB Fawn. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.